Bob and Sherry, sponsored by Bank of America Customized Cash Rewards Credit Card. Earn 3% cash back on online shopping. Here's Bob and Sherry. Wow. They did not stop talking. It's exhausting. It's the Bob and Sherry Show with Bob. Why don't you give the storytelling a rest and try something else? And Sherry. She looks like a wooden doll you find in an Eastern European toy shop. And now broadcasting from the palatial Bob and Sherry Studios, it's Bob and Sherry. Okay, so I am coming to you from Sevierville, Tennessee this week as my daughter competes in uh, dance nationals. And last night... Um, I went to the Titanic Museum in Pigeon Forge with Karamia and Danielle, and that was quite an experience, you guys. The Titanic Museum is a replica of the Titanic rammed into the iceberg. And so as you come upon it on the highway, it's a little bit surreal because it's huge and it's the Titanic and it's halfway shoved into an iceberg. And you have to you have to get your tickets in advance um, because it sells out. And you, you go in and people in costumes board you and, and you're given um, a card, a boarding pass that has the name of a real passenger on it. And you find out at the end, after you go through the whole experience, whether or not your passenger survived or perished when the Titanic well, that's, went down. That's a bit on the dark side. You, isn't you guys, it? it really is. Um, it's a self-guided Good tour. Lord. You get this little audio device that you you know hold up to your ear like a phone. And there there are parts of the museum that are um, very interesting historically, like the way that the ship was built. And there are all sorts of photographs that maybe you've not seen before. And then there's a section where you go out onto the deck after it's hit the iceberg. And there's an enormous wall of real ice that you can touch. Yeah. And there are these um, things you can submerge your hand in that are the same temperature as the North Atlantic where the ship went down. So you can see how cold the water was. And once I put my hand in there, I'm here to tell you that Kate Winslet needed to budge over on that damn door. Because that is cold water. Yeah, yeah that's right. It, it is a very strange experience to go through the Titanic Museum. There are lots of, like, you know, silver settings and pieces of china and an occasional piece of luggage that they fished up off the bottom of the sea. And lots so and those lots are, of those are uh, those are actual items. They're not replicas. Yes. No, those are actual items. Mm -hmm. There are, I mean, there are a handful. There's like a replica dress in the millionaire suite, but for the most part, you're looking at real salvaged items. And there's there's a lot of information about the shipbuilders and the ship designers and the crew and the captain and all of the passengers. And then at the end, you find out whether or not you lived or died, and then you're you know sort of emptied out into the gift shop so we 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 went last night and my passenger was bertha mulvahill third class 25 coming to rhode island providence rhode island to get married uh, she was living in the united states with her sister went back to ireland to go to another sister's wedding and was coming home on the titanic to get married and she did survive my passenger survived oh good hear me Karamia and Danielle played sisters, also third class from Ireland, and they both survived. This was Danielle's fifth time at the Titanic Museum, and she was devastated that this time she lived again. She was really rooting to have gone down with the ship on, on her fifth visit. So fun fact, Danielle's dad got married at the Titanic Museum. Uh, a couple, two years ago, Danielle? A year ago. He got married a year ago at the Titanic Museum. Really? And we all agreed that while this, the Grand Staircase is magnificent, it just does seem like a weird venue to take your wedding vows in. But, you know, whatever. How's the, uh, I'm just, I have to ask, uh, how's the marriage going? Well, so far, so good. You know, so far, uh, so good, as best yeah, we know. Okay. It's, okay. it's just a weird thing. Like, we were talking about it last night uh, while we were eating dinner before we went to the museum. The symbolism of... Um, the Titanic as a place to pledge your undying love to each other. And apparently a lot of people do get married there. So it wasn't just, I, I, I just want to stop you. I just want to say why the hell would anybody get, I'm sorry. Why the heck would anybody get married at the Titanic I, museum? It is hard you, enough to get through the choppy waters of matrimony. <laughs> right. Uh, right. 
the Danielle and Kermie are eating pancakes right right next to me in our little three bears cottage. Uh, hang on. Danielle, was your dad a big fan of the movie Titanic? His new bride a big fan of the movie Titanic? Da- Dan- Danielle does not know why her dad picked the Titanic. Uh, does, as ask the her her father, you, does her father like to paint women? <laughs> ask, ask her that. I can't because she'll throw up and then we'll have a mess oh, to clean up. Okay. Bob right. wanted me to ask, ask if your dad liked, you know, drawing, like, draw me like your French girls, Jack. Oh, oh yeah, she's traumatized. All right, I'm going to have to wrap the show up early to take her for emergency therapy and counseling for that. Um, but so, yes, I want to talk to Max. Max agrees with me. I mean, seriously, it, it, the, the ship of marriage is, 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 a, is a sturdy ship most of the time, but can't spring some leaks. You know, why, why what, start there? Here's what happens. If it doesn't go well, then people are going to go, why, you did get married at the Titanic. Right. You know they will. Let me, ask, let me ask Danielle another question. Did they say their vows in front of the giant iceberg or on the grand staircase? They did their vows on the staircase. Right. And the pictures are probably really beautiful, right? Yeah, yeah. Hang, yeah. on, hang on, y'all. Okay, Mary's, they Mary's, did... Hang on. Mary's in the kitchen. Hey, Mayor, why don't we uh, renew our vows at Alcatraz? <laughs> you, you know, uh, <laughs> I just saw a thing with James Cameron, and apparently he took a little license with some of the characters in that movie, and one of them was one of the, uh, one of the crew, uh, and he shot and killed somebody that was trying to get on a boat or something. Anyhow, he said, they said, he said if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have done that because I heard from the man's family. Who is still oh, alive? Oh wow! And of course, he had had a name affixed to him, and he said yeah. they were none too pleased that they, uh, I had portrayed their relative in this way. What was it? The uh, wow. uh, Was it the private detective who was? Uh, no, no, he no. was one of the crew. One he of was the one of the crew, okay. and the, I, I can't um, remember what his name was. I did. I did learn something really interesting that I didn't know about Titanic at the Titanic Museum. Um, We were never able to figure out why um, anyone would get married there, but here's what I did learn. The the floor of the Grand Staircase was made of something that today we we not only take for granted, but we look down on. But at the time, it was considered the product of the future. It was linoleum. Really? Because it was lighter. It looks looks like marble, but it was the flooring of the future. It could yeah. handle any amount of traffic, and you couldn't crack it or break it, and it was easy to clean. And so the actual real Titanic ship, the the Grand Staircase, was covered with linoleum. All the wood was hand-carved and, like, right. mahogany hang, and amazing, but the floor was hang actually on, Hang linoleum. on a sec. So I Mary, 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 how about Chernobyl? Why don't we uh, renew our vows <laughs> at Chernobyl? <laughs> All right. We have, to, we have to break. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey! As many weddings as I have, I'm sure I can come come up with one where I jump into a volcano. It's Bob and Sherry. Get Lamar's review sent right to your phone. Text movie to eight 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 Bob Sherry. So we're talking about the Titanic Museum, which is in Pigeon Forge. Um, and Karami and Danielle and I went last night. It was a very interesting experience. I'm a big fan of the movie. I've read a lot of books about Titanic. But I have to be completely honest. It felt morbid and a, a little bit wrong in some ways. You know, because these beautiful girls in period clothing are, Welcome aboard Titanic, the largest ship in the world. See you in New York in a week. and And it's like... Okay, it's a horrific tragedy and disaster that we all know is coming. And to have it be sort of a theme park experience is weird. And when we got out last night, you know, you have to, if you're going, you got to reserve your tickets in advance. It sells out. We got out last night a little before 10 o'clock and it was dark and rainy and dreary. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. there was this heaviness that's on you. Because the last thing you do before you go to the gift shop is check and see if the passenger whose boarding pass you're carrying made it out alive. By the way, I went to the to, to a traveling version of that exhibit, and I did not survive. Because really? they, they did it with a traveling version too. Yeah, wow. they had a traveling version that I went to in Philadelphia, and they did the same thing with the water and the ice, and you could feel how cold it was. So I, it, it has to be very similar to uh, the one that I went to. 
I said to the girls there. when we were driving back to the place we're staying, I was like, you know, I feel kind of morbid and grim, but we'll just we'll just take some time tonight to remember the souls that were lost on Titanic. Because there's otherwise, just something you feel within like a ghoul, right? the human. There's something within the human um, psyche that just, in some way, is attracted to the macabre. Have you ever been to Madame Trousseau's wax museum anywhere? Yeah, yeah. I went to the one in London, and uh, that's the only one I've ever been to. And so you're up in one floor, and then they say uh, the floor of horrors is down below. And so there are two German women who are in front of me, uh, because it, London is an international city, and, and uh, they're middle-aged, and they're walking down very tight uh, little stairway. And uh, we get to the bottom to go into the uh, Hall of Horrors, where they have, you know, just mass murderers and all that. And you make the turn, and the first thing you see is Adolf Hitler. And I'm behind these two German women, and they look up and they go, Oh! Oh! There's just, yeah, there's just something, something uh, that, that human beings, it, it's, it's a visceral appeal to look into horror. There's just something gruesome. And I'm, I'm with two dancers here who um, spent one day with John Wayne Gacy and a night on the Titanic. Like, what, <laughs> how can we top this? <laughs> what, what is left for us at this point? You know, are we gonna, well, it's not like, the happiest gonna... place on earth, I'll tell you that much. We're... Oh, wow. Today well, we're going to Six Flags over Smallpox, a theme park. <laughs> 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 Morons in the News is next. It's Bob and Sherry. We've got him. Morons. With Bob and Sherry. He's a moron. It's Morons in the News. Oh, God, so God. when, Sherry, you think about pistachios, what comes to mind? What comes to mind right away? Um, the, com- the TV commercials. Okay, well, what about the product itself? That my whole life I thought they were red and then only recently discovered that that was dye. Right, that's one thing. And what what else about pistachios, the, the purchasing of pistachios? They cost more than buying a black market human kidney. Bingo! And that takes us to Tulare County, California. The sheriff's office posted a missing pistachio uh, story on its Facebook page. According to the statement, the Touchstone Pistachio Company noticed 42 thousand pounds of pistachios had gone missing during a routine audit. How do you miss 42,000 pounds? But they did. The company reported the situation to the sheriff's office and they opened a pistachio investigation. According to the Facebook post, it was eventually discovered that a tractor trailer had been moved from the pistachio company to an unnamed nearby lot. There, it was discovered that the pistachios were stashed in 2,000-pound sacks. Now, if I'm the pistachio bandit, I'm still wondering, how do I I sell that? Hey, buddy, uh, come over here. Yeah, over to the truck. What do you give me for a 2,000-pound bag of (laughs) pistachios? 2,000 pounds, yeah. All right, get a couple of friends. Anyway, uh, the plan was to move them, I guess, eventually into smaller bags. Authorities arrested Alberto Montemayor uh, of Montemayor Trucking in relation to the incident. The uh, Facebook page went on to say the remaining pistachios were returned to Touchstone Pistachio Company. And of course, people today, if it's on Facebook, have to comment. One comment was, good job, detectives. I guess you really cracked that case. (laughs) And the other one was, that guy must have been nuts to think he could get away with it. Everybody's in show business. Sherry? Oh, oh. I'm just trying to figure out what, like, a pound of pistachios costs at the grocery store. 2,000 pounds of them? You can't afford that. You don't got that kind of money. You can't. No, I know. Exactly. Right. Today, today's moron of the day is a couple that tried so hard to save their love and they failed. Um, a Ukrainian couple, um, in a last-ditch attempt to save their broken relationship, handcuffed themselves to each other for 123 days. It still did not work. Alexander Kudle and Victoria Pusavitova officially broke up. The entire breakup, including the handcuffs being removed by bolt cutters, was aired on national television in Ukraine. Hmm. Hooray, shouted Victoria when the handcuffs were removed. I am finally free. Um, He had the uh, handcuff idea, and on 
Valentine's Day, they started the experiment. Victoria said, I thought this will be an interesting experience for me. They were handcuffed together for three months and they did everything together. Showered together, took smoke breaks together, took Mm -hmm. turns using the bathroom together, worked together. Um, And instead of bringing them closer together, the experience made them crazy. They had more and more arguments. Sometimes the arguments would last four plus hours. They decided they were not compatible and ended up having to have the handcuffs removed with bolt cutters. So so they're Um, not going to stay a couple even without the handcuffs? Even without the handcuffs, yeah. They did earn a world record for the most time a couple has ever spent chained together. Mm -hmm. And to honor that achievement, that world record, that's why it was broadcast on national television. Today, not only are they no longer handcuffed together, they are living in completely separate parts of the country. That's how much they needed to get away from each other. Text the word moron right now to 888-262-7437. We'll send today's moron of the day straight to your phone and we'll automatically register you to win a bottle of People Make Me Sick, the official hand sanitizer of the Bob and Sherry Show. You know, uh, that was an interesting little uh, sentence in there. They took turns uh, using the bathroom. How how would that work? If you're um, in a way that you could never endure, Bob, unless you were being held captive in a pervert's basement. <laughs> so, like, I don't know. He turned away? Or... Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's got one hand that... Ooh. Yeah, I could see they were some handcuffed to each other. Yeah, I so... could see some real problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you can't get much distance there, my friend. Yeah. Mary, let's change the role in the uh, in the bathroom, shall we? Let's let's use the handcuff. Just just go ahead. Let's just change. we're out. Okay. No, I would not do well with that. No, this is not for you, Bob. This kind of complete loss of privacy being mm-hmm. although you've definitely been chained down. Um, not oh, for yeah. you. That is morons yeah. in the news coming up. We're gonna take you down the rabbit hole with an amazing high school commencement and comedian Tom Papa. It's Bob and Sherry. All of us at the Bob and Sherry show would like to thank you. Thanks for helping us in this crazy past year as we recognize together healthcare heroes, essential workers, first responders, and thanks for your help finding those who have struggled in the pandemic with the fill the fridge promotion. Mostly We'd like to thank you for sticking with us during this time and look forward with you to brighter times on the horizon from the Bob and Sherry show. Congratulations, Sherry Lynch, named one of the most influential women in radio again this year. It's Bob and Sherry. I would like the help of the women, the uh, the women who listen to the Bob and Sherry show right now. I would like you to call or text 888-B-O-B-S-H-E-R-I with uh, what I'm going to ask you, an answer to what I'm going to ask you. Or maybe go to hello at bobandsherry.com and you can download the app and you hit the microphone and you can talk directly to us. So I want to know if women have um, a spouse, a husband, a boyfriend, whatever, and he has a certain phrase that he'll use every once in a while, right? Mm-hmm. And it just drives you out of the out of your mind. You want to punch him right in the throat every time he uses the phrase. And the phrase has probably been part of his lexicon, you know, since before you met him. It's just part of what, you know, how he expresses himself. My wife has two or three... Uh, I irritate her with two or three phrases to the point that she'll just stop and just stare at me. She hates them so much. And I just think that they're so innocuous. For instance, if I say, um, oh, that's chump change for that. Oh, no. Doesn't like that at all. She 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 doesn't like the phrase chump change. Chump change. Can't stand it. And then the other day, you know, I've planted uh, this good sized tree in the backyard so I could block myself from seeing my neighbors. I'm just going to be honest. It's a, it's a good sized tree. And then I put a bush in the front uh, and we just needed something in an area that was open. So I'm very worried about these things and I want them to get enough water, but then I don't want to spend uh, half of my salary on water because water is expensive. And the guy uh, who helped me plant it said, you got to water this every other day. So I'm out there every other day, and the tree is pretty big, and I'm watering, and I'm going, this is going to cost a lot. And then I have to drag the hose over to the bush. And so far, so good. Well, I saw that uh, there was going to be uh, a lot of rain coming to the area. 
And I was very excited about that. And I said to, I said to Mary, it's going to rain really heavy. This is a few days ago. It's going to be raining really heavy. And that's going to be great because I don't have to pay for it. And we're going to be using some of the natural to water it. And she said, what? I said, we're going to use some natural, you know, rain. She said, don't ever say that again. That is, that is, that is just <laughs> such an annoying thing to say. And I know where I got it. You get so much from your parents and you don't even realize it. I remember my old man opening the window like in uh, late summer and saying, ah, oh, good. Uh, uh, we'll have to pay for that air conditioning. Let's get some natural in here. He would say that all the time. He'd be, he'd be driving down the, uh, the road smoking a cigarette. He finished the cigarette. He says, let me put the window down, get some natural in here. And so <laughs> that has, which I appreciated because I was, you know, my brother and I were suffocating in the back. Um, that has been in my I've mind. I've never heard I that expression before. Uh-uh. I've never That's, heard that used that way before. Mm-mm. I haven't either. That was like a Big Bob original. Let's get some. And this has been a long time ago, but that stuck in my brain. And I just thought, you know, it's raining outside. I'm going to get some natural for the uh, for the for the plants. So I want I want the the women who are listening to uh, get a hold of us. Is there a phrase that just kind of drives you crazy? Uh, here's another one. Here, and this is from a commercial. I, I don't I forget which commercial for for like a frozen food thing. Um I had some leftover pasta that I made, right? This was years ago when Mary and I were first uh, married. So uh, I, I got it out and I put it in, in, a, in a dish and I went over to the microwave. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to uh, microwave this pasta from last night. I'm going to heat it up and eat it up. <laughs> Don't ever say that again or I'll stab you in the throat. <laughs> I said, it's just heat it up or eat it up. It's from like, I don't know, Dinty Moore or something. I don't know. It was from there my only, childhood. There are only two things that my husband says that absolutely turned me into a candidate for this season on Snapped. The first one is um, I'll be telling him something and he'll respond with, I got nothing for you. Oh, not the classic. That's oh, a you classic. Have nothing, you have nothing for me? You have nothing for yeah. me? I have something yeah. for you. It's an <laughs> iron pan. <laughs> and I'm gonna beat the of it. Okay, and then the other thing that he says, if he uses the word sweetheart in a sentence, whatever follows it is going to piss me off righteously. And it's always oh. something like this. Sweetheart. I know that con- you thought it yeah. was a good idea too. And whatever yeah. is coming next makes it's me condescending. crazy. It's, co- yeah, it's condescending. It makes me yeah. absolutely crazy. Absolutely. I could see that one, actually. All right. Well, we'll yeah. see what the Mormons are yeah. uh, saying. Maybe yeah. they'll uh, get a hold yeah. of us. Or maybe it's just us. Who knows? The next time he tells me that he's got nothing for me, I'm going to tell him that I'm going to kill him and heat him up and eat him up. <laughs> that, <laughs> so much, that makes me crazy. We're going to take you down the rabbit hole next with what I think is the greatest high school principal moment at a, at a commencement ever 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 it's bob and sherry remember when you were a kid and and your life was a lot simpler and the biggest conflict you had was whose turn it was to pick the fun cereal because you know your mom was always buying in in my case some generic odie rings you know but once in a while me or my brothers would get to pick a box of the good stuff and we were so happy to have it we'd eat it for breakfast we'd have it as an after-school snack we'd beg to have it for dinner and wouldn't it be great to go back to that you know except for the fact that the cereals you loved as a kid are loaded with carbs and sugars and a bunch of unpronounceable stuff and artificial flavors and colors. But here you are slugging down a gruesome protein drink every morning and being nostalgic for being a kid. What if you could have it both ways? What if you could have the crunchy, sweet, delicious cereal you remember and all of the protein you need as a grown-up? Magic Spoon to the rescue. Magic Spoon cereal has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, GMO-free, only 140 calories a serving. But forget all that because it's delicious. And when you go to magicspoon.com, you can build your own box. You can create your own custom bundle, cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon. You can even mix some of those up. Like if you mix frosted and cinnamon together, It's like a cinnamon roll in a bowl. It's so good. Go to magicspoon.com slash Sherry. You can grab a custom bundle of cereal to try today. And when you use the promo code Sherry at checkout, you'll even save $5 off your order. Plus, Magic Spoon says you're going to love it. And if you don't, no drama, 100% happiness guarantee. 
we will refund your money, no questions asked. Magic Spoon now ships to Canada, so our friends in the Great White North can also get in on the fun. Magicspoon.com, delicious guilt-free cereal. Magicspoon.com slash share. Use that promo code at checkout and save $5 off. And thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode of the Bob and Sherry podcast. Bob and Sherry sponsored by Bank of America Customized Cash Rewards Credit Card. Earn 3% cash back on online shopping. Here's Bob and Sherry. Bob and Sherry, go. This is so wonderful, Bob. You're going to love it. Um, This is a Uh high school principal at a graduation ceremony, a commencement ceremony um, in North Carolina. And instead of giving a speech to the graduating seniors and their families, he did something really unusual. And you're going to be blown away. Here we go. That is, what a voice. You know that Dolly had no idea the legs that that song would have when she sat down with a guitar or a piano, probably a guitar, when she wrote that song. She had no idea that Whitney Houston would use it as her signature song after Clive Davis said, you need a signature song. And I think this is it. I cannot remember where I saw the interview where Dolly Parton was asked, Dolly, what did you think of Whitney's rendition of I Will Always Love You? And Dolly laughed and said, well, I'll tell you, Whitney has made me so much money. <laughs> and it's <just> the best, <laughs> the best response. Um, the idea that this principle, and we'll post this video, by the way. Um, you can see it on the Bob and Cherry Facebook page. We'll post this. This principle just casually singing with a voice like that Instead of giving a speech to those kids, I got goosebumps. I just He's loved got, it. He has so much range. I mean, that guy has such an amazing, amazing voice. I think he must have performed for that school before because they seemed to know what was coming when he was just warming up there for a minute. What a what a fantastic What's voice. amazing? That's a that's you know, that's a phone video. You know? I mean, that's amazing yeah. that he was able to pull yeah. that off. Yeah, I, you really have to have range to sing that song. When I first, I want to thank our listener, uh, Rocco, who tweeted that to me. Here is someone, you know, he's got a doctorate in education, is is a great leader, a great school administrator, a great teacher. Oh, and he can just happen to sing like that too, right? Yeah, that's a lot of gifts. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's that's what happened with that song. You know, I think if Whitney did not pick it up and, and she wasn't the one who found it, it was Clive Davis the uh, famous uh, producer for Columbia Records, uh, if if he had not suggested that, I think that song would have sort of been an oblivion because Dolly had a country hit with it, but it wasn't a, a massive, massive song. It did take Whitney Houston's amazing vocal uh, acrobatics to uh, to put that over the top. And now, you know, you hear a gifted man like this, keep it going too. It's a great song. But I think it did take the artistry of Whitney to make it um, famous. Well, it forever. went. It yeah. I mean, it went global mainstream with Whitney's cover. Um, right. What you're saying reminds me of the uh, comments on Twitter that went along with this. So people cannot. Uh, and when it comes to social media, people can never just say, 
oh, well, that was good. There always has to be a Karen in there who goes, um, and, and I'm, I'm looking at the tweet right now, beautiful, but let's give credit to Dolly Parton. The words are her. And then another person is like, yeah, but Whitney Houston made the song what it was. Here's the thing. Yes, we Dolly wrote it, and Whitney used to made it what it was. This dude stood up and sang that to those kids. I who was in that auditorium for that commencement will ever, ever forget it. I agree. You know, the people who uh, add on to it, well, you know, but Whitney really made it pop popular and Dolly actually wrote it. Those are the people at your meeting when it's about to break up. Go on with one more comment that everybody already knows just because this, they know it. And it drives you this, crazy. This era in history will be defined as the yeah, but, and what about era. Yeah, Yeah, but, what about? Yeah, Yeah. but, it's just a moment. Can you just not enjoy a freaking moment without having to poke a pin in the freaking balloon, people? All right, I'm going to post this on our Facebook right now. We've got comedian Tom Papa coming up. um, And maybe we need to think about multiple marriages and breakups and relationships in a different way than we do. It's all coming up for you. It's Bob and Sherry. Sign up for the newsletter with Bob and Sherry exclusive articles. Sign up now at bobandsherry.com. Um, thank everyone for their patience. And by everyone, I mean Max, really, because, of course, I'm coming to you from Dolly Parton's hometown of Sevierville, Tennessee this week. I am broadcasting from the cabin that the three bears lived in when Goldilocks came to visit. And even though I'm plugged into Ethernet and the internet is pretty good here, it's still been a little bit choppy. I found this place back in February when I found out where Karamia was dancing by hunting on like Airbnb and VRBO. I was what I was looking for were those um, unicorn millennial real estate investors. You know the ones I mean? Their names are like always Bradley and Hannah. And they started out with $300. <laughs> they started out with $300 and they were doing bees in the backyard and selling their own honey at a farmer's market. And then somehow they part a small Airbnb rental empire. You know, the people I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. The reason that I was looking for Bradley and Hannah's millennial real estate empire is, is because those those Airbnb hosts, they make technology a big part of whatever they're renting. So whether you're renting like a room in their house in the, you know, Napa wine country or a beach place or this little teeny cabin in Sevierville, they lead with how um, wired up they are. Like all this uh, high speed internet and multiple Wi-Fi points and flat screen TVs everywhere. So I wasn't really looking for convenience or location. I was looking for Bradley and Hannah to pimp my ride in terms of internet. And this was the most up internet rental place I could find. And even with that, we're having a few problems. So I apologize for that. And I thank everyone for their patience. Did that you is guys- so true. If you're going to, if you're going to have an Airbnb, you have got to have good internet or you're going to have people who would turn you down these days. Who would have thought? Uh, right. I mean, you would. And and honestly, what I would like very much is to be unplugged in this beautiful place, but that I'm working while Karamia dances. So being unplugged is not an option. Did you guys see the story? It might not have popped in your news feed. What people what rich people in the Hamptons are doing to try to get a restaurant table this summer? Did you? I did see that. That was in The New York Times. And they um, it, it was hard to read because. It was so over the top. There are people who are going up to, let's say, the host or the hostess, the person at the door who has control over the tables, and saying, I will give you uh, a weekend on my yacht. 
I will give you in one case, I think it was a thousand dollars to uh oh, yeah. to guarantee to guarantee a reservation. A um here's the thing, like I I would I like to go out to dinner and would very much like to not have to cook and clean up. But how desperately do you need to go out to dinner that you would make these kind of offers? I mean, tickets to NASCAR races, Bob's right, weekends on yachts, um, five, six, seven hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar cash tips slid across. How much money do you have if this is how you're living? Well, they have a lot of money. I mean, these are people who are probably on Wall Street or in some form of business that they have a very high income and they are just sick and tired of not getting into a restaurant. And of course, uh, summer's just about here. They want to eat outside at their favorite place in Montauk and they're willing to, uh, th- they're willing to throw down the money. So be honest, if you had that kind of cash, is this how you would spend it? I thought about that because I loved restaurants. But, you know, once poor, always poor. I don't think that I can say, and, and I love helping out servers, don't get me wrong, but I don't think I can say, if you can get my family in here, we will give you $1,000. It seems excessive. And, and it's not just this one shot. There are people who evidently are doing this consistently, where they say, we're, we're, I'm going to give you thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. And sometimes it's to the owner. If you will allow me on Friday nights to have a table for four every Friday night for the rest of the summer. I don't, I don't know. It seems excessive. I know for a fact that I wouldn't do that. There's just no way that I could do that. We took um, Ada, who's 18 months now. We took Kevin and I took Ada out to breakfast on Saturday morning. And she had scrambled eggs, Canadian bacon, and a piece of toast with strawberry jam. And when she was finished, I got down on the floor and cleaned up the scrambled <laughs> eggs, Canadian bacon, and yeah. toast of strawberry jam that were scattered because I spent too many years as a server to walk out of a restaurant and leave that mess on the floor. So if yeah. I'm on my hands and knees at Billy's Breakfast Bucket scrubbing their floor, do you really think I'm giving you $1,000 to sit down? At a nice table. Uh, well, and on the one hand, I do like the idea that servers or owners of restaurants who have struggled are getting money to make up for their losses. I think that's a re- very good thing. And, you know, frankly, it's all relative. If you're making $20 million a year, dropping over the course of the summer uh, $25,000, $30,000 on restaurants, it's not that much. I mean, somebody that really needs that money pockets that yeah. 900 bucks. It's yeah. just, wow. I wouldn't, if I was doing that, I wouldn't be telling anybody about it. That's for sure. Would you? No, 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 no. It seems excessive. You're right. It's like it's like that giant Powerball win in that tiny Maryland town. The people are staying anonymous because they don't want to be hounded for it. Comedian Tom Papa is next. It's Bob and Sherry. The Bob and Sherry website. The Oddcast. Contest info. BobandSherry.com. Let's do it. It's time for Everyone Needs a Laugh. This is comedian Tom Papa. Good to see you guys. Good job, everybody. Good job. You did it. You're alive. Another day. You made it. Not a small thing. Not a small thing. It's hard being a person, isn't it? It's hard. All the stuff you got to do just to take care of you. Just the physical maintenance of you. All the brushing and the cleaning and the wiping of you. (laughs) It's like you're your own pet. (laughs) And some people don't take care of their pet very well. They're walking around, their hair's messed up, they don't look like they eat right. Just the checklist of stuff you have to do to get out of the house to look somewhat decent. I saw a guy walking down 6th Avenue this summer. I'm walking the other way. Businessman, perfect. Suit, tie, leather shoes, briefcase, perfect glasses, perfect hair, fly open, one (laughs) testicle out. (laughs) (laughs) Just didn't check that one box. (laughs) Just on his way to a meeting. Probably on his way back from a meeting. (laughs) <laughs> no, that's the other thing. As an adult, no one tells you. They probably looked him right in the eye in that meeting. Look at this guy. He has no idea. <laughs> I'm not going to tell him. I got my own problems. <laughs> I don't know if I put on deodorant today. 
No one tells you. You're completely alone. When you're little, they tell you, hey, zip up your fly. Put on deodorant. Brush your teeth. No. Now you're totally on your own. Even your wife or your husband won't tell you. You got to talk to yourself all day long. Give yourself little pep talks like a crazy person. <laughs> I, got, I got my wallet. Got my cell phone. Okay. I got, I got my keys. Okay. It's going to be a good day. Going to be a good day. The only difference between you and a crazy person is they say it out loud on the street. I got my wallet, got my cell phone. <laughs> it's gonna be a great day. <laughs> You're looking at him, this guy's nuts. We don't yell like that. No, we don't. We've got our act together. <laughs> we should get some ice cream. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard being a person. Even my iPhone turned on me. My iPhone, my only true friend in the world, is now categorizing photos on its own. It considers my normal face and my fat face to be two different people. <laughs> All this technology just to count how many chins I have. It's a mess. My family's a mess. I have a mean girl. I mean, I have a mean girl. Yeah, I made a mean girl. I, yeah, I didn't know they existed. I didn't think I was going to make one. I feel guilty, you know? I, I, I'm feeding it. <laughs> I'm keeping it alive. I give it money. Uh, but what do I do? Just cut her off like she's a terrorist? I can't do that. She's my kid. How do I even know how bad she really is? She's my kid. I'm sure at some point, Hitler's parents must have turned to each other like, he's a little weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's weird. He's six. Who has that mustache? It's six. <laughs> It's hard. And then look, I, you're doing fine. Don't think because your life is hard that you're struggling and it's going to get better. No, you're not going to get better. <laughs> no, I haven't even met you and I know you're doing fine. This is as good as it gets. Be content. Right? You see people on TV, uh, fame and money, and you think, oh, if I could get like that, then my life would be better. No, you'll be worse. Look at the people who have it. They're, they're not happy. Brad Pitt and Angelina breaking up. They're breaking up. Good. They deserve it. No, that was arrogance. You don't put two perfect people in one marriage and think it's going to work. That is arrogance. You, 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 too many options. You could be with anyone on the planet. You want your marriage to last, you need a little funny looking in it. <laughs> you need to look across the table and think, where are you going to go? Seriously, when you're young and stupid, you think you want a supermodel. No, you moron. You don't want some beautiful girl asking to be taken to Europe. You want a girl with a crooked eye asking if you got jumper cable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a keeper. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Great delivery. This <laughs> comedian Tom Papa. It's Bob and Sherry. Welcome to the Bob and Sherry store. You can stock up for summer with deals down every aisle. With Bob and Sherry swag you can use, including a really big 24-ounce Bob and Sherry latte mug, plus Bob and Sherry travel mugs and H2O Go bottles, plus our brand new Mother of All Mothers line with oversized teas, candles, enormous tote bags, and more. Just hit shop at bobandsherry.com. Oh, wait a the Bob and Sherry website, the oddcast, contest info, bobandsherry.com. One of my friends grabbed a screenshot of this and sent it to me and said, um, you guys love a good bridezilla. Meet this one. And I could not, I've read it twice because I couldn't believe that anyone could, could be this way, that you could put, that you could demand these things. This is um, wow. a, a, an email, I guess, or a post that went out to everyone invited to the wedding. And here's how it goes. Hey, everyone. So we're all well aware that my wedding is coming up in October, four exclamation points. I've already sent out all the invitations, meaning most of you have gotten them. Thanks for those who've RSVP'd already. If you've not, then please RSVP by Sunday. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to have you. That being said, I'd like to announce our gift registry to everyone. To all those coming to my wedding, there are a list of gifts you can bring. You must choose from that list 
or consult me first. There are no exceptions. The list includes number one, any KitchenAid appliances over $350. This does not mean regular kitchen items like an apron or a spatula. I'm talking about their stand mixer, blender, etc. Number two, any Gucci or Louis Vuitton purses. Other purses are allowed, but please consult me first. Number three, any clothing over $400 from uh, Calvin Klein, Moschino, Moschino, or Norris. And let me just pause here. When did we start giving designer handbags and clothing as a wedding gift? Anyone? Um, not in my lifetime. I've not seen that on a wedding registry. No. All right. Number four. New floor tiles for the entire house. I know this is a bit of a stretch, but I'd gladly appreciate it. Number five, a new car or new trim for my car or anything in relation to my car. Number six, $400 or more in gift cards to any of the following places. Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom, Calvin Klein, Gucci, Whole Foods, Sprouts, maybe JCPenney. Other places are acceptable, but please talk to me first. (laughs) Number seven, Any Korean or Asian beauty products totaling $400 or more. Number eight, any high-class paintings or decorations totaling $400 or more. And finally, a cash gift of $400 or more. So as you can see, there are a lot of things on here. I am expecting everyone to expend at least $400 on the wedding gift. I will accept slightly lower amounts as long as you tell me first. Also, everything on here is first come, first served. Here's a link to the spreadsheet where you can find out who's bringing what. And remember to apply early if you don't want to get me that Gucci purse or anything you don't want. Thanks, loves, XOXO. (laughs) Okay, so this person is one of several things, maybe two of several things. Number one, a very spoiled bee. Number two, someone who is putting us on because it's hard to believe that anybody, there's no one I know that has the chutzpah to say it, it has to start at $400. And I guess number three, somebody who is living in an alternative universe to most of us. I just, did we, have we started, do you think, demanding clothing and handbags and stuff as a wedding gift? I, I think it's real, and I'll tell you why. This is somebody who's been in other weddings and knows how much it costs to be in a wedding. And that's why they're saying stuff like that. I think Max is right. I do think this is real. I don't think this is a prank. And I do think this is someone who lives in a different world than we do in terms of like money and privilege. I think maybe if this is your reality, this is your reality. I just, I cannot imagine telling somebody, um, I'm going to need a Gucci purse for my wedding. Like, first of all, it's supposed to be a gift for both of you, right? Right. <laughs> like, let me get Ideally. The, <laughs> let me jump in and get the grooms back here. What's in it for him with all of this? Uh, what's in it for him is a lifetime of living with a pain in the ass. That's pretty much what's in it for him. You know, I understand what you're saying about this. This is a person who comes from a background that is perhaps very, very privileged. However, you know, I know some rich people and it's not like the only other people they know are other rich people. They know a lot of other rich people at the country club or their business or wherever it may be. But they also know that they have some cousins uh, who cannot afford twelve hundred dollars for a clutch. Right. Well, then I'm I mean, how, guessing I'm touch. guessing her attitude would be if you can't afford it, then you can't afford to come to my wedding. I guess twelve hundred dollars yeah. is how much I paid to get a clutch put in my car. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that I mean, isn't that just breathtaking? It is. So, Max, you, you think it's it's on the up and I, up? I think this is real. Yeah, because we've had two or three of these so far this wedding season. And I think you're right, Sherry. For people that have a different reality, this is nothing. And it's probably not even offensive to the the guests. Like, we're over here being all outraged, like the dirty peasants we are. But maybe to the people that these this couple knows, maybe they're all like, yeah, well, I mean, if you don't if you don't say it, you know, if you don't ask, you won't get it. Right. Maybe. No, I think it's completely offensive. Even even to people with a lot of money. It's really offensive. Her her. um, 
just the controlling factor of what she wants, the minimum of what she wants. There, there could have been other ways that she could have put it. My favorite is a uh, favorite type of person is goose, uh, Gucci, you know, you, and just leave it at that. The idea that she's actually see rich people don't they don't say dollar amounts. That's that's very, very low class. I don't know any people who are rich and I know a bunch who would use dollar signs on something it's, like that. She new, doesn't have any class. New money. <laughs> yeah, that could be it. That could be it. Yeah. I don't know. I just know that if that if those are the rules, I I don't want to be invited to your wedding. I'm already having to drag an unwilling husband along <laughs> and and tell him, "Yeah, but they're going to have meatballs or whatever. You're going to love it. You know, we don't have to stay very late." Now I've got to do that and cough up a KitchenAid stand mixer or a Gucci purse for you. Come and on. not tell him and not tell him what you spent because you don't want to hear him going, "Are you kidding me? I can't stand her. What are you doing that for?" Yeah. Oh, well, his favorite thing is to tell me, you know, when I when I first got out of college, I lived on seven dollars a year and, you know, scrounged at the right. dumpsters. Oh, please. Yeah, no, oh, I don't man. just don't even invite me to this wedding. It's Bob and Sherry. Bob and Sherry sponsored by Bank of America. Customized cash rewards credit card. Earn three percent cash back on online shopping. Here's Bob and Sherry. It is talk back time on the show, and there are so many ways you can do it. You can uh, text us at 888-262-7437. If you have the Bob and Sherry app, it's free in Google Play and the Apple Store. You can just tap the little microphone at the bottom of the screen and talk, or you can always email us old school at bobandsherry.com and DM us on the socials and all of that. Okay, this message is for Bob, and it's important. Bob, listen, do not get the relish from Blackie's your favorite place for hot dogs and come home and bring it to Mary for her to try. You know what will happen. She will not like it and your feelings will be incredibly hurt because she doesn't like the relish that you think is the best relish in the world. Love you guys. Thanks for everything you do and hope everyone's doing well. Thank you. Well, um, that's a listener. That's a listener. That, that is a listener. I, I am going to uh, see some high school friends in a couple of weeks, and Blackie's is a hot dog joint that I was last at when I was ten years old. They're famous. They're famous for this relish, this this uh, homemade relish, and I, and I I don't remember what it tastes like, but everybody talks about it. I mean, it's considered the greatest hot dog in all of New England, and all I can do is think about it. And they sell it. And I just thought it would be a good idea to bring it back and let Mary try it. What was the you, what was the last jar of something you brought back that was random that she didn't understand? Remember Max? Didn't he bring yeah. a condiment of some sort yeah. home just recently? <clears throat> it, some jam, some yeah, jam. Yeah, yeah. And and she yeah. looked at the jam. It was a road one of these roadside places where they make fresh jam by them. You know. You know, I don't know, somebody knows how to uh, jar it or whatever they do. And I went, you know, I'll bring that. She hasn't even opened it yet. Almost despite me. Almost despite me. If she was mystified by jam, which is something she likes, what is she going to make of a jar of relish? (laughs) Just take why, a minute. Why am why just, just am I fighting on this hill? Why it's just I, I jam know. and relish. Open the thing up and see if you like it. But if 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 people don't like it as much as you do, then you do get your feelings hurt about it. You do. You know how you are. It's not that my feelings are hurt. I feel sorry for them that they <laughs> don't experience something that uh, I know is great. Okay, so that's what that comes down to. How can you be a person like that? Your feelings get hurt. How can you walk hurt. amongst us? Your feelings get hurt. And then you add that to the laundry list of things that you have not been successful at. The Kelly Green handbag, the uh, monogrammed sweater. Like there's a long list of things you've tried to give her that she's confused by. And I think, Bob, you may, do you want to talk about a hill to die on? You're going to reach the peak of that particular mountain when you hand that woman a random jar of specialty hot dog relish. She's never <laughs> going to understand it. She's never going to understand it. You know, you know, you know, you're right. I'm just a horrible person for being uh, thoughtful about, about bringing something, about, about thinking about my wife while I'm away. What a horrible person I am to think about bringing something. Tonight on the I, life... I, I, Tonight on the Lifetime Movie Network, Daddy Condiment. 
He thought he was being thoughtful, but instead he was trying to control her one spread at a time. All right, that's fine. I won't bring it. I won't bring it. And actually, I'm, I'm, you know what? I probably can't because I'm going to be carrying on in the plane. I'm going to be carrying on. I, you think I'm going to be able to get relish through? Probably not. <laughs> you're lucky to get toothpaste and underpants through. Are I know. You you're not getting I relish. know it. I know it. Well, thanks to our listener. And uh, forget it. No relish for her. There you That's go. fine. Yeah. Her yeah. loss. Suffer, yeah. Mary Lacey. Suffer. That's right. All the more for me. <laughs> it's Bob and Sherry. Congratulations, Sherry Lynch, named one of the most influential women in radio again this year. It's Bob and Sherry. I don't know how closely um, everyone else follows the Olympics. I'm a huge fan, and I really like the Summer Olympics in particular. I don't know why. I can't do any of the things. I can't swim or do gymnastics or anything, but I really have always loved since I was a kid watching the Olympic Games, and this summer's games are going to be really, really, well, bizarre is the only word for it. They are going to go forward in Tokyo. Cheering has been banned. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, I had heard that. Cheering's been banned because what an excellent way to spread germs, right? Yelling and hollering in other people's faces. Um, They they weren't going to have any fans originally. And then they said, oh, well, that's going to be hard, hard on the athletes and hard on everything else. So now they're going to have 50% capacity, a maximum of 10,000 fans. And you have to be a resident of Japan in order to attend an event, whether it's indoors or outdoors. So there won't be like, you know how usually when you watch the Olympic games, you know, the cameras go into the stand and there's, you know, a whole swath of Americans that have traveled around the world to support you know, this athlete that grew up in their town. You won't you won't see any of that this time around. Um, all the fans have to be from Japan. And they banned all spectators from abroad. Um, even some local uh, ticket holders have to give them up now because they're not going to allow as many people in. And the Japanese government said that if coronavirus cases tick up at all, they'll clamp down again. So, These games are already going to be unlike anything in your lifetime. And it's possible that they're going to get even stranger. What do you think? Well, you know, it's they had talked about not having them at all because they had had such a spike in COVID cases in Japan. So this was sort of the compromise that they reached in order to do this. And it's kind of sad because... That's got to hurt them financially because part of the thing, part of the reason you have the Olympics is for the economic impact. And that has been lessened dramatically. I can actually give you some numbers about that. Um, The Olympic organizing crew in Tokyo had predicted that they'd make about eight hundred million dollars just from ticket sales alone. But now they're going to make about half of that. And any shortfall uh, is going to be paid for by the Japanese government. These are the most, according to what I read, the Tokyo Games are the most expensive Olympic Games on record, about $15 billion. But um, the word is, is that it's going to end up costing almost double that because of all the restrictions that have to be put in place and all the reductions in people that can actually come to the game. And it's all going to have to come out of the taxpayers pockets what a nightmare you know you know that olympic games have been canceled in the past during world war one and world war two but i guess that was the last time they canceled games right yeah but i mean there's been countries that have boycotted some of them along the way i think russia did us and we did russia somewhere along the line in the early 80s but uh, you know i mean this is these are the most unusual circumstances for an olympics in our lifetime it's going to be um, it's going to be really something to see. I wonder how many people who ordinarily wouldn't pay that much attention will tune in and watch just a little bit of it to see how different it is. I don't even know. Like one of the wildest, most hallucinatory television experiences you can have are the opening and closing ceremonies of any Olympic Games. Right. Like they're in the costumes, the, the ritual, it's crazy. I don't even know what that's going to look like if they're keeping um, all of these athletes so separate from each other. So it'll be interesting to see. And in a way, um, in a way, this may be the most 
memorable Olympics that we've had in modern history just because of all of this. So coming up, straight ahead, advertisers now want to infiltrate your dreams. Go ahead, Max, what were you going to say? I was going to say, and for the first time, I think in 12 years, Ryan Lochte, the swimmer, will not be in the Olympics. He missed it the other day by two seconds. And after the fiasco that happened uh, in the last Olympics where there was the fake robbery and all this other stuff, he wanted to come back and try to prove himself again, but he won't get that opportunity this time. And he couldn't do it. Uh -uh. Yeah, couldn't Uh -uh. do it. Well, that made me when I saw that. I mean, Ryan Lochte, he's kind of like America's goofy brother. Yeah. You know, he's like, oh, it's Ryan Lochte. But you're... I was sad for him because I know that his whole life has been aimed at these games. Yeah, and this is his last chance. His last shot. Straight ahead, your ads that are in your newsfeed are about to be in your dreams. You read it once. I don't believe that. And then you read it again. I can't believe this. It's Bob and Cherry's. I believe this. I cannot believe this. You know how it drives you crazy when ads start showing up in your news feed? Like, we'll talk about, you know, a mattress, and then for the rest of the day, all you see are yes. mattress ads. Yes. Or you, you'll, somebody will mention something casually, like in another room, and then you're getting ads for it. You know how that drives you crazy? Mm-hmm. Well, 40 different dream researchers got together and published a letter to the Federal Trade Commission um, urging the FTC to consider policies to ban targeted dream incubation, or TDI. Targeted dream incubation uses specific audio and visual stimuli to induce dreaming in your brain to place advertising messages into your dreams. So the letter says the potential for misuse of this technology is so ominous that it's obvious what are we doing in planning advertising messages into people's dreams? And if you're wondering, well, how real is this? Back in January, Coors Light did an experiment that showed sports fans commercials while they slept after the Super Bowl um, in an effort to see if this would penetrate into their unconscious dreaming mind, passive unconscious overnight advertising, dream linked advertising. I don't really know how this works. It sounds like an episode. I'm of trying Black to Mirror. figure it out. Yeah. I'm trying to figure it out. I can't, how, if, if you don't have a device on, how would they uh, go about doing that? So it, it's very confusing. Um, but what they do is they, uh, the, the, what Coors did was they were experimenting with, could you play advertising messages to people who are sleeping and would they retain them? But targeted dream, this TDI technology is not a gimmick, but it's a way of using very specific sounds and images to implant ideas in people's minds that will then kind of blossom while you're sleeping. Kind of like the subliminal advertising scare of, uh, I I can't remember if it was in the 70s or the 80s, I've read about it, where people said that advertisers were, you know, hiding images in the ice cubes and soft drink commercials that would, you know, make your subliminal mind um, uh, respond to these things. It's kind of like that, only it's a little more sinister because it's, it's using technology and marketing tactics to cause people to dream about products. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm already bombarded all day long on social media with leggings and like there's this one product that's all over my social right now. It's a clothing company called Blue Salt and mm-hmm. it's this wrap. So the the woman is like, you can wear the Blue Salt wrap three ways. And she drapes it around herself like a blanket, then like a scarf and then like a cape. And I'm like... Lady, I could do that with a beach towel for a fraction of the price, like whatever. <laughs> I've seen, if, I've seen the ad. I know what you mean. Right? If if that's in my, if that's all over my social, like, am I going to close my eyes at night and have this woman showing me how to wrap a blanket around myself? But how so are it, they getting to it's your very mind? Sinister. How are are they are they planning these uh, suggestions? In spots that you might hear when you're listening to radio or TV yes. or on the internet, and then and, and on then social, they yeah. they germinate later on. 
they're done in a specific way that they'll germinate later on? That's the basic targeted dream incubation. That's the basic huh. idea. Now, does it work? I guess... I guess we need to see if it works. I mean, if anyone out there is dreaming advertising messages, let us know. But it, it's sinister enough that 40 different sleep researchers are petitioning the FTC to ban this sort of advertising technology. And, Cor- and Coors has already done that. I'm, I wonder what they did. Coors does not taste like just water. Coors does not <laughs> taste like just water. So that here's what... Um, the, the 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 way that Coors did it in January, they were trying to implant these ideas. Now, whether or not it was successful, I haven't seen more people drinking Coors um, versus not. But the idea that that a bunch of sleep researchers are going to the government about this, that should give you yeah. something to think about. Yeah, I agree. You know? I agree. So yeah. we'll post this up on our Facebook so you can check it out. And I apologize because now all of you are going to have Coors advertising all over your <laughs> news feeds today. And that's all That's all our fault. It's Bob and Sherry. Welcome to the Bob and Sherry store. You can stock up for summer with deals down every aisle. With Bob and Sherry swag you can use, including a really big 24-ounce Bob and Sherry latte mug. Plus, Bob and Sherry travel mugs and H2O Go Bob. Models, plus our brand new Mother of All Mothers line with oversized teas, candles, enormous tote bags, and more. Just hit shop at bobandsherry.com. A shareable taste of the show. The Fun Size Podcast drops every Thursday on the free Bob and Sherry app. Okay, it's time for another episode of America is Back. We're out there. We're going to beaches. We're going to big cities. We're eating outdoors. We're eating indoors. We're having a great time. But you know what? When you travel, when you go on vacation this year, don't be a tourist. Be a traveler. Travelers are smart. They take things in. They're observant. Tourists, they act like idiots sometimes. And that leads me to this collection of moments that people have observed tourists. And these are folks who live in highly tourist areas. So uh, I don't know if that's the right way to put it. Uh, Areas where tourists go, vacation areas, they live uh, permanently and they see a lot. For instance, this dude, I've seen somebody try to skinny dip at one of the most popular beaches in Florida. Dude had a cop running toward him before he ever got his naked butt into the water. So let me (laughs) ask you this. It's, It's not a nude beach, right? It's a regular beach. Are you doing some day drinking or... What is it that said to this guy, I'm going to drop my uh, my swimsuit and just walk down to the water and swim naked in front of everybody? Who does that? That surprises me not at all. They're the life of the party. They're a giant pain in the butt. That's just how they roll. No, the life of the party goes and says, hey, I'm going over to the beach bar. Anybody want a uh, Corona? He does not take his swimsuit off and walk down to the water. That is crazy. Here's a person who lives near Banff up in Canada. Mary and I were there a couple of years ago. It's just so beautiful. Uh, This person said, a tourist with a baby in a snuggly on her chest got out of her car in a bear jam. A bear jam is when, you know, some bears are by the side of the road. Everybody sees them. They stop. They get their cameras out and the traffic is backed up. This woman with the snuggly baby on her chest walked up to the bear and tried to hand it an orange. Folks, it's not, they're not Disney characters. They're not little um, uh, creatures in Chuck E. Cheese. They can kill you and your baby. Why are you doing that? What, what gets into somebody's head that that's okay to do, Sherry? This is every day at Yellowstone, Bob. Every single day. People really? think that people think that because the animals see people so much that they're like yeah. theme park attractions or something. Yeah, they are not. Uh, this person was chilling on a beach somewhere, and the couple next to her was getting smashed. They had a three to four year old, so while they were kind of blackout drunk, the child started playing in the water unsupervised. She had a floaty vest, but that was it. The current started taking the kid out to sea. And I had to go get her. Can you imagine if the worst happened and you had to look back all the rest of your life? 
on the fact that you and your husband or you and your wife are getting drunk and the kid went out to save. I don't know if you could go on. Uh, people who hang on the edge of the Grand Canyon, past the guardrails, are completely stupid. Seven to ten people fall to their death from the North Rim every year. I didn't know that. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. That, that is that is a lot. Spent a few years in grizzly country. Once had a mother spray her kids down with bear spray because she thought it was repellent. It's actually, it's bear mace, and it's very, very strong. It, it, as a matter of fact, one guy who sold me a can of it once up in uh, Canada uh, said, this this will stop a bear more than a gun. That's how strong it is if you hit, if you hit the uh, bear in the eyes with it. You don't okay. spray your kids with it. Can we, can we pause here? Because I thought, I thought I could go on, but the idea of spraying children with bear spray, <laughs> I, I can't anymore this is my last day on earth i can't i I can't stay in this world but obviously it's been done it's been done and and so many of these things are done in beautiful areas one tourist again in canada around the banff area tried to put their toddler on a moose for a picture a moose weighs literally a ton it literally weighs a ton and they're goofy looking but they're also very dangerous. I, I've seen them up close, and don't go near them. Near but them. just think how many likes you get. I mean, well, you, well, well, you know, would, that's, what, that's what that's about. Might be worth it. That is exactly that's what that's about. I uh, saw a tourist try to swim in the ocean while a shark siren is going off. If the shark siren is going off, um, the lifeguards have spotted a bunch of them. Don't go in the water. You this know what person, that is? You know what that is? That person thinks that the shark siren is for the sharks. That the sharks will hear that siren and know they're supposed to go away. (laughs) You're right. Uh, And this one, I'll end with this one. Tourists tried to reach down out of a boat on a swamp tour and pet an alligator. (laughs) What do you say? Don't be a tourist. (laughs) Be a traveler. Yeah. It's Bob and Sherry. Congratulations, Sherry Lynch. Named one of the most influential women in radio again this year. It's Bob and Sherry. I was reading about a famous actor, and he is in the news a lot in the last few weeks. And people are just kind of following his private life and a few people delving into his professional life and how his career uh, became what it is. He's one of the biggest actors in the country right now. And in 1993, he wanted to be a director in addition to being an actor. And so he signed on to be a director of the following movie. I killed my lesbian wife, hung her on a meat hook, and now I have a three-picture deal at Disney. That was the name of this short satirical film, Very Dark Comedy. Hmm. And the director... As I said, he's very well known as a director and as an actor, has disavowed the film. He told Entertainment Weekly, it's horrible. It's atrocious. I knew I wanted to be a director. I did a couple of short films, and this is the one that haunts me. I'm not proud of it. It looks like it was made by someone who has no prospects and no promise. But it did not tarnish his career. Who is he? Is it Quentin Tarantino? No, it's not. But what a great Based on the uh, title, what a great guess that is. And it's you said first that he was an actor who also wanted to be a director. Yes, correct. And I well, think I know this it's was not be- Ron Howard. I can tell you that. It's, it's not Ron, Ron Howard. Howard. I think this was before his actual first hit as a uh, movie star. He had a, a big movie a few years after this film came out. And again, uh, I've never seen it anywhere, even with all the movies people have been watching and I've been watching uh, because of COVID. I killed my lesbian wife, hung her on a meat hook, and now I have a three picture deal at Disney I've never heard of. Mm. You know, part of me wants to say James Franco, but it's not him either. It's not. He's Um, in the news a lot right now. um, Can't be Brad Pitt. No. No. But but he he's more famous as an actor or as yes, a, like, although although he's respected as a director now, but he's much more famous as an actor. Clint Eastwood, no younger guy. I give up. Ben Affleck. Wow. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was never going to get there. So I'm glad I gave up. I was never yeah. going to guess Ben Affleck. He said he said he just he feels terrible about playing it. It was about a director who uh, discovered that his wife uh, was gay. And he said that he was so embarrassed by it that he he killed her and then tried to find a, another actress to take the part that he was looking for. And it, it, it's pretty convoluted. But Affleck said it was the biggest embarrassment of his career. You know, you kind of knew what it was when you took it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the title. Maybe um, that wasn't. A lot of them have. They're called working title until yeah. they get a title. So maybe he was working on it, but didn't know what the title was. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's like in in, in my um, line of work, my going to work for a show that um, is just a shock jock show, right? Testosterone driven shock jock show where, you know, they as a stunt, they have a couple go into a church and uh, fool around, which actually did happen with a really crappy radio show. So I go to work for them. Am I any better than anybody else on that program? You know, Uh, no, I'm not. I'm a scumbag for having done that. You just wonder, did you, you know, it's so hard to make it in in show business, in movies, that I guess you just grab anything you can. And there's probably guys that are pretty good directors that do porns, uh, but they need to get the money coming in or the practice coming in directing. Um, well, you know, to like may, and I have no idea cause I didn't know anything about this, but you know, maybe at the time I'm trying to think when this would have been for Ben Affleck, like 1990s. Okay. So mid-90s. 1993, maybe right. this Good just Will seemed Hunting like, came out in 98, I think. Yeah. Maybe this just seemed like the very height of edgy artsy underground yeah. cinema. Yeah. Yeah. It's not it a good time. It's not a catchy title. I mean, it's a mouthful of a title. It's only 16 minutes long. Hmm. Hmm. So it's what they used to call a short. I will say that Ben Affleck is um, one of these people who he's like a cat with nine lives. He, he seems to, um, he seems to recover from whatever the, the mistake of the moment is pretty, pretty well. You know, he does. He hasn't killed anybody or broken any laws. I mean, mostly he's a menace to himself, it seems, right? He's very self-destructive. But he he recovers very nicely from whatever and ends up, you know, consoling himself with Jennifer Lopez. So right. it might not be the worst thing ever to be Ben Affleck. Right. Is, is Are they going to get married, do you think? Um, Bob, anybody that puts good like real money down on whether or not JLo is going to make it to the altar with someone. That's a sucker's bet. I'm not taking it. I, I would say not, not now her, her biggest priority, I think really is her children, despite what we might think. Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't think so. Yeah. I think they can get along as a couple and have uh, a nice life without having to go down the aisle. They were engaged once before. She was engaged to A-Rod. I think she was engaged to Chris Judd. The one that she married, because she married one, they broke up. He runs a restaurant now. Then she married Mark Anthony, a.k.a. Baby Girl. She married him, and they had those beautiful children, and they split up. And I think that, you know, J-Lo is a little, she loves romance and loves to to rock a ring but she's a little bit slower to finalize it now and no judgment there right no not at all no judgment and (laughs) and she's able to ricochet into the arms of ben affleck while the rest of us ricochet into the arms of ben and jerry it's just (laughs) not a fair (laughs) rule it's just not what a perfect line sherry lynch that is one of your best recently good for you bob and sherry Get the free Bob and Sherry app and instantly get the podcast, the oddcast, and Bob and Sherry fun size. Okay, we have a little correction. Um, I was mistaken. Jennifer Lopez did marry Chris Judd. So this would be her, th- if she marries Ben Affleck, this would be her third marriage? I believe and fifth so. engagement or something like that. You know what? Sounds normal. <laughs> Who even cares? Let's normalize. Let's normalize that. And let's thank J-Lo for leading the way. You know, you can't win in this world. Uh, here's here she is. She's a believer in love and she's a believer in commitment and a believer in promises and monogamy and all of that. You know what?
what? Go get it, J-Lo. What difference does it all make when it's when when it's the end and we're fossils, right? Go get it. And the fact that she can, you know, uh, be engaged a million times to all these different um, really hot guys, like, yeah, girl, you go get that. <laughs> you just do what you have to do. I don't I don't know why um, as a culture we're so like quick to be critical of someone who um, is married or is a serial monogamist, romantic, marrier kind of person. I'm trying to think where I was, some, was some podcast that I was listening to. The um, the husband, who of course was the murderer, because that's how that goes. Uh, it turned out that he had lied and he was on, this was his seventh marriage. And, the, and of course the um, Dateline crew was like, it was not wife number three, it was wife number seven. And you can hear that a couple of different ways. You can go, well, there's a guy that's really reckless and out of control. Or you can say, here's a guy that no matter how much ugly experience life throws at him, he doesn't give up. He doesn't become cynical. He's not a quitter. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> that is a very generous, generous way to look at it, though. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you rather that people said, you know what, Bob, you're no quitter <laughs> than, than the opposite? Like, why can't we why can't we look at things in a more positive way? Right. J-Lo, she's been through it. Girl's been through it. And yet her her heart is still wide open to the possibility of love and trust and a happy ending. I don't know. I mean, it does depend on how you look at it. Nobody ever said, Hitler, you know, they say some negative things about you, but all you were trying to do was expand the boundaries of your home. You just, well, well, that, that's all you really wanted to do. We'll limit it to um, marriage and relationships then, since, you know, it's going to be hard to find a, a way to defend like Pol Pot. But these people that have all these, these different, um, you know, like, why, why not just say, well, life is hard. And sometimes we all know people that get knocked down and they can't get back up. They got rejected and they, they were never able to get back out there again, whether it was in relationships or career or whatever. They took that rejection and they swallowed it whole and it bloomed a bitter flower of defeat inside them and they never got past it. Mm -hmm. Why, why is it that, that, that's all that's preferable for some people to someone like JLo, who's like, you know what? Break my heart once, shame on you. Break it twice, shame on me. Break it three times, paging Ben Affleck. Like, why can't we <laughs> why can't we be good with that? I think that it's because people love gossip and they like to feel that their lives are better than um, someone else they know, whether it's J Lo or a cousin or whoever it may be, uh, an ex, right? And so they say, oh, did you hear uh, my ex, you know, Diane? Yeah, she's getting divorced. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Second time, right? She's going to be out there again. I think it gives people the feeling that they're more in control of a better existence than someone else that they know. It's, well, people, I mean, that's an illusion. It's human nature to a degree. That's an illusion. Let's all take the pledge right now. If today, at some point, you hear of someone who... Um, is on yet their next relationship instead of going oh my god oh my god karen's got a revolving door try saying you get it karen you you are not a quitter and you are not cynical you believe in love and happy endings no matter what experiences you've had yes, i am girl, i am yes. going to do that i'm going to do that because anybody named karen these days needs all the help needs she can break. get <laughs> it's bob and sherry get bob and sherry swag in our store at bob and i have a really cool story that i'm following um a painting i guess that looked like garbage to whoever had it was donated to a landfill in Canada. And I guess um, when stuff gets sent to the landfill, I guess whoever runs the landfill pulls out things that they think they might could sell for mm -hmm. charity. And they have like right. a little store at the landfill. So oh, um, a customer good. was just browsing in the landfill donation center. This is in Ontario. It happened last summer, but it's the, the story is just breaking now because it's selling. It was a painting and it was a, a fairly small painting and kind of not really detailed. It's like the person is in profile and there's no really clear facial features. And it's just like a, the painting is colorful. There's a little bit of ivory and pink and teal. 
And um, it turns out that on the back of it, it had the artist's signature, and that would be David Bowie, the late rock star David Bowie. Oh, really? This is one of his paintings. So something that ended up in a landfill, because whoever had it thought it was garbage, um, is now going to sell for well over fourteen thousand dollars, most likely. Wow! Bids are uh, have you right seen now. Have you seen a picture of it, or are you just mm-hmm. reading about it? No, no, mm-mm. I've seen a picture of it. When I when I saw the news story hit my feed, I googled around and and read a bunch of stories about it. This isn't the first David Bowie painting. Um, there was another painting, and other paintings that Bowie did uh, back in like two thousand and one and two thousand two that were sold for just a little bit of money. Um, But a lot of people didn't really know, unless you're a hardcore Bowie fan, you really didn't know that Bowie Mm -hmm. also painted. But Mm -hmm. big Bowie fans knew that he did. And the person who found this in the landfill obviously was a big Bowie fan, saw the signature Mm -hmm. and knew exactly what they were getting. So, and because Bowie died, when did he die? It wasn't that long ago, Uh, seven years years ago maybe? No, I think it's oh. been it's been longer, it than, longer that, than that, hasn't it, Max? Okay. Yeah. I think so. I'll find out. He died of he died of cancer. Anyway, now that Bowie's gone, uh, obviously the value for this sort of thing. 2016. That's when he died. So it was a few years ago. Um, it, the value of this sort of thing as a collectible has gone up about 300 percent. I bet. Yeah, there are a lot of musicians who are also artists. Tony Bennett is a renowned artist. He's very, very good. He's been painting for years. And uh, the Rolling Stones guitarist, Ron Wood, is uh, yeah, a paints. terrific artist. Yeah, and tours with his paintings. Don't you always... I, I love going into, like, um, antique stores and places like Value Village and the Salvation Army. Like, all that. I love all that stuff. And I always go and check out the the paintings. Because you, you never know, right? People find priceless artworks and copies of the Declaration of Independence and all sorts of amazing things in these places. So far, I have found a paint by numbers of a whale. I'm pretty sure it was a paint by numbers of a whale (laughs) and some really gruesome um, paintings that weren't even bad enough to be good. Like, you know, sometimes you'll see something that's so awful that it's actually a masterpiece Mm -hmm. in a junk store. I, Mm -hmm. I would love to stumble across something like this, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Who wouldn't? But most of the time, you know, you're not going to. This is few and far between. That's why it makes news. But nonetheless, uh, getting back to the the Bowie painting, uh, where is it now? Who has it now? Is somebody going to sell it? Christie's Christie's? is selling it. Yeah, they're doing it as they're doing it as an auction. And for all I know, the bidding has stopped. I mean, it just popped in my news feed, and I I saw it. Here's what I don't know. I don't know who had the painting and chucked it. Because it just sort of showed up in the landfill donation store. So I have no idea what Bowie fan, or maybe um, maybe what happened was the Bowie fan was a teenager and mm-hmm. moved out and left it in a box full of crap in mom and dad's basement. Or there was and, a breakup in a relationship and the yeah. uh, Bowie fan went another direction. There was a lot of anger, just said, I, I just don't care. And and the other person really didn't know. And it was not to his or her liking. And so out it goes. There was um, there was a in the news story about this David uh, Bowie painting. They recounted the story. This happened a while back. A woman in California bought this huge drip and splash abstract painting. She paid five dollars for it at a thrift store in 1992. And it turned out that it was um, a work by Jackson Pollock. Oh, it was wow. worth Whoa. millions. Whoa. <laughs> and it was just in a thrift store. So maybe the next time you're in a thrift store or some junky, you know, flea market kind of thing, take a walk over to that stack of paintings and paw through it because you never know. It does happen, and it does happen more than you think that people stumble across these masterpieces. It's Bob and Sherry. Welcome to the Bob and Sherry store. You can stock up for summer with deals down every aisle. With Bob and Sherry swag you can use, including a really big 24-ounce Bob and Sherry latte mug, plus Bob and Sherry travel mugs and H2O Go bottles, plus our brand new Mother of All Mothers line with oversized teas, candles, enormous tote bags, and more. Just hit shop at bobandsherry.com. Oh. 
Michael Mars review sent right to your phone. Text movie to 888 Bob Share. So I read this article about how Americans are now interested in going out and traveling again, not only in our great country or your great state, but also to more exotic places somewhere around the world because they ain't been nowhere for a while. And I'm reading this article and I'm thinking about two experiences that one that happened to me and one that happened to a former uh, sister-in-law. So what happened to me, I went to uh, Rio de Janeiro um, and I took a TV crew. And we were very excited about it. We had a male photographer who uh, was very, very good with a camera and was also interested in taking some really sexy shots. And so he said, let's get out of the beach. And that's that's where the string bikini started, Copacabana Beach. And I went, OK, let's go down there. He says, let me get my uh, backpack. And he put the backpack on. It had a beautiful still camera in there. And we're walking to the hotel, which is right on the beach. You go two blocks beyond the beach in Copacabana, you know, it gets to be kind of a rough area. And we're walking down there and we finally get to the beach and he reaches around and the camera's gone. Somebody had walked up behind him and deftly taken a razor blade and cut the bottom of it, let the camera fall, took it it in his shirt or wherever and walked away. We went back to the room a couple of hours later and got a phone call. Are you interested in getting your camera? And other items and so we get in a cab and we go to this location and the location is in a rough part of uh uh, rio the cab driver wouldn't take us any further and we had we had a walk and he said i don't know about this and i said i don't either but there it is we went in we met with uh the people who own this appliance store they took us to the back room and there's a couple of guys with the s looking uh smile on their faces saying uh, yeah, we might have it. Anyway, we had to pay them off. We got his his uh, wallet back with his IDs and all the cash going. The other story was my sister-in-law was coming out of a hotel in, in uh, Vietnam, the, working as a missionary. She stepped out in the street. A guy on a, a mini bike went by and grabbed her handbag, which was around her shoulder, and ripped it right off, took her down to the concrete, and she had a messed up shoulder for like several years. So uh, when I saw this article about things that you need to be aware of when you travel, especially alone, I thought, yeah, let's tell everybody about this. The first, this is posted by um, a woman who kind of specializes in this. And her first one is get business cards wherever you're staying, like the business card of the hotel. Because if you're out there in the streets and your phone goes dead and you think that's how you're going to get your information, your phone's dead now, and what are you going to do? If you have the business card, at least you can you know, show a cab driver or whoever exactly where you are. Secure your bags. In other words, you're sitting down, you're in an airport, you're in a restaurant. If you're a woman, you've got a bag with a strap, put it at your feet and put your leg through it, through the strap. If you're traveling alone, uh, instead of walking out of the hotel alone, wait for a group of people and join in with them. So it looks like you are with a group. Uh, There are all sorts of uh, special locks you can put on a door. My wife, Mary, has has one. You can uh, hide cash, dollars, in everyday items like a first aid kit, a gum pack, a mirror, or in deodorant. That's a good idea. Ask for two keys at the front desk if you're traveling alone. Ask for two keys. So it signals to anybody working at the desk or anybody working anywhere near I- uh, earshot that you're not alone. Hang the do not disturb sign up and leave it on the door for the remainder of the stay. Um, there's a, there's an article, uh, article of, in a uh, piece of equipment, and it's uh, a little loop. looks like it's made out of some rubber, and it's attached to little bells. Hang it on the door of your room. Anybody tries to jingle that, then they get they hear the jingle bells. Um, if a station sorry, has, where are y'all it, going? Where are y'all going on vacation? Oh my god! Out, out of this country, anywhere, or even in certain parts of this country. <laughs> um, I'll just put if, some bells around my own neck. That should annoy the hell out of anyone that tries to snatch me. Oh my god! Go on, go you, on. You don't think you don't think these make sense? I do. I think it. I think it's always good to be vigilant. It's just, 
I mean, you know, there are people who are terrified to travel and this right. is probably not helping very much. You do well, have it's to giving them a, a heads up. If you're going yeah, to do it, yeah. like if you have nice jewelry, even if it's fake looking jewelry, you got to hide it somewhere. You know, you just can't go out there in a big city. Something could happen. Uh, be aware of what's around you. Don't be distracted too much by your phones. And this one is really interesting. Um, if you have a bag tag where you've just written your name, address and phone number, anybody can just look down and see it. You could get a bag <laughs> tag. That is plastic, and it covers it over. Somebody looks down, they can't see anything. I have one of those myself, as a matter of fact. And finally, you can cover the peephole with tissue paper. So nobody can get in there and look into your room, even if it's distorted. Sherry doesn't think we need to do this, but, you know, I think it's not a bad idea. To, I didn't say we didn't need to do it, but... Yeah, well, then, if you're, in a, if you're in a hotel without a safe, hide your cash in the ironing board evidently they don't look there tape it behind a tv the only so. person in the world that even uses an ironing board anymore is my mother and with that broken hip she's not out robbing y'all like she used to so <laughs> so that's go a good put place put your money in the ironing board yeah Stay put your money in the sure. ironing board that's right it's Bob and Sherry. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the Bob and Sherry podcast and the Bob and Sherry Oddcast. We would love if you would subscribe, rate and review, and share it with a friend on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you go. And thank you again for listening.